Today on Country Squire Radio, it's a... Here's what we're looking at now. As you can see, I've been getting some stuff done. Hello, Internet! Welcome to Food Theory. From the premier source of Pipe and Tobacco News, it's Briar Report. Hey everybody, welcome to the Syndicated Pipe Club. Tonight we are going to be discussing Mandalorian Episode 5, The Gunslinger. I'm Dave, the Pipe Pirate, and as always in the wings, we have Greg, the Badger Piper, coming in. How you doing tonight, Greg? Uh, trying to keep my drink from <laughs> spilling over. Had to kind of readjust some things on here. It's been a a little bit since I've been out into the garage. Yes, it has. It's been a little bit since we've uh, actually recorded anything together, as most people don't realize, or maybe they do because they saw one of the bonus episodes we've uh, cooked together by now. If that, if they've put two and two together, what they realize is just last week recording time, you had your son. That is correct. He is here, and uh, he is... Uh doing well actually thankfully so uh you know despite a, a little bit of a dramatic uh entrance but uh you know as long as he's doing okay then i'm happy so and that is all you can ask for when it comes to kids that they're healthy exactly. that they have all 10 fingers 10 toes and from this point on you're going to be seeing lots of doctors anyway for the next few months so if there's anything else eh, they'll catch it at least I would think so. I hope so. <laughs> uh, but think, yeah, no, no deformities, no, no weird things like tails or uh, third, three or third arms or anything of that matter. Super speed. What about super speed? Did he get that? Did you see any evidence of that yet? No, no, not yet. Uh, and unfortunately, um, she did not go for any of my obvious uh, civilian names that will automatically grant you superpowers at some point, like Rock Justice. Oh, darn it. But I must admit, though, I, I was a little uh, curious at your choice of name because of you know the show I mentioned to you that we may cover here eventually. Yes. <laughs> oh, for sure. Um, well, that name actually has been in consideration for years. That's very similar to my oldest son, William. He's William Stanley, and I've always wanted that to be... Since my second grandfather died, there was always going to be a William Stanley at some point, as long as I had more than one son. And when we had trouble conceiving the first, uh, he he's the one who got the name. Hmm. Yeah, uh, for those that don't know, uh, my son's name is Milo, and... Uh, I got that name actually from a book called The Phantom Tollbooth. And that it's always it's been a name that's always kind of stuck with me and my wife liked it, so uh, I ended up going with that one. And of course, as soon as I heard Milo, I, you know, immediately thought of Milo Murphy's Law. Because Weird Al and Murphy's Law just go together so well. Right. So that obviously wasn't where the name came from, but you never know. We have each have Disney Plus. Maybe eventually we will cover Milo Murphy's Law. At least, you know, maybe in general, not episode per episode. Right. I'm going for it. But that being said, we are here today, tonight, this afternoon, next week, to discuss the Gunslinger, episode five of The Mandalorian. And by the time this episode comes out, we are actually only days away. From maybe a couple of things. We were probably only days away from, well, maybe a couple of weeks away from my child being born. And we we're only about the same amount of time away from the release of season two of The Mandalorian at this point. As we're recording at the end of September, but this one's coming out around the end of October. Yeah, it'll be uh, right around the corner that uh, season two comes. 
So, uh, you know, I think we made a good choice in following the show so we can jump right in and be a little bit more current than, uh, <laughs> than yeah. this one. Yeah. But that's why we're syndicated, Pipe Club. That's right. We do reruns. But we will do current, and we'll go straight into The Mandalorian Season 2 once we are both there. Mm-hmm. And probably after my child gets here, so we can get the dynamic set back up. But what are your thoughts on The Gunslinger? Well, first I was curious about... Uh... What kind of uh, pipe and uh, tobacco you were smoking tonight? Good point. I forgot about that. Okay, so pipe I'm smoking is a Morgan Bones, just a bent billiard. And in it, I am smoking some Sutliff Crumble Cake uh, English Number no. 1. Uh, the first uh, offering they did for the Sutliff uh, Virtual pipe, pipe Club. Yeah, that's a qu- quite a good one. One of the few Sutliff brands, or, yeah, brands, I guess, Sutliff offerings, that you don't have to dry out for a day before you smoke it. Yeah, it comes in more of like a traditional kind of tin rather than a, the, their normal fare. So it's a, it's quite nice. Absolutely. One of my favorite Englishes for if you just want a nice English that's light and... Uh, doesn't bite. Not a not a not a big fan of the crumble cake aspect of it, but yeah, I that was this is my first crumble cake, so mm. it is what it is. I, I think uh, I think it doesn't last as long in a crumble cake form as it would in say, you know, just you you know your normal. Uh, ribbon cut right no i mean there's definitely you know crumble cake's definitely a bit different uh, but i like it um it, it kind of reminds me a bit of um seattle pipe clubs uh plum pudding in uh the way that it's kind of presented not necessarily the taste but they're both kind of english blends so I like them mm-hmm. so I have to apologize uh, I just noticed here that you guys may be able to hear the exhaust fan in my basement pulling everything out because I can, I can see it registering on the monitor so if you can hear the high pitched whine sorry nothing I can do I gotta be able to exhaust I forgot to put the noise gate on to pull that out so now well, something I can try to take out and post maybe but anyway what are you smoking tonight greg uh this is my uh gbd bent uh bulldog uh one of my uh go-to pipes it's uh that i picked up in the 2018 chicago pipe show and uh the tobacco um this is actually the first pipe i've had since the birth of my son and I wanted to celebrate, uh, you know, my, you know, return to smoking a pipe and, uh, the birth of my son with a very special blend. And, uh, there is a gentleman on Instagram that I am friends with that was kind enough to gift me a tin in celebration of, uh, a couple of months ago. And I told him that I would, uh, this would be the first blend that I would smoke in, uh, after my son was born. And it's actually by a company called uh, McClellan, which is no longer around. And it's a uh, Frog Morton, ah. which is uh, one of their legendary blends. So I got to crack that tin open today and uh, I'm uh, quite enjoying it. Nice. The original Frog on a Log. Yeah, that, that was a good one. And I'm sorry, anyone who might be interested in trying to get a hold of that, as Greg said, McClellan closed down. About two, three, maybe three years ago now, and uh, you can find it on eBay. But you're going to pay for it. You're absolutely going to pay for it. Yeah. 
My blend, as far as I know, that I'm smoking is readily available. I'll double check it, and if it is, I'll leave a link in the description down below so you can find a place to buy it and check it out if you want. But, now that we got the, the pipe and tobacco stuff out of the way, which is not the main focus of today's episode, what are your thoughts on the Gunslinger? The Gunslinger, yes. It is... Uh... I actually uh, sat down and watched this episode with my uh, mom in the room as my wife was taking care of my son. Uh, she didn't really watch the show, so but I, I just, you know, watched the show and it, I thought it was, uh, I thought it was quite good. You know, there was uh, a lot of uh, fun moments in the episode. It's uh, one of those... Uh, you know, unlikely, well, like, uh, you know, unwary kind of partnership type episodes where you know that uh, when they, when they uh, get together to team up, that this isn't something that's going to last through the whole episode. At some point, there's going to be a turn. And so it, uh, it made for an interesting watch. Uh, again, it's nothing that's you know, necessarily like mind-blowingly original, but it's so well told that uh, it's enjoyable. Yeah, yeah, we've seen these uh, these stories before in westerns. It's a it's a standard western story, you know. Mm -hmm. Guy uh, going going past, just passing through, maybe you know, looking for a new horse, or for some reason he needs to get some money up, and he's in this. Um, one horse town, which the one horse town being Moss Eisley on Tatooine really uh, set the scene because desert planet, so perfect. Yeah, and they they did a nice job, kind of uh, going back to uh, locations that we've seen before, and kind of showing how things have changed since we've seen them last. Yes. Yeah, I was watching that uh, that scene in the cantina. So you're thinking of thinking of myself. All I could hear was Star Wars, Star Wars cantina. <laughs> and then I was as I was watching and uh, bounty hunter in training. I can't remember the character's name, so we'll just call him Han Wannabe. Sitting in the exact same booth where Han was sitting when he was uh, taking on Greedo. And if you want, you can go ahead and you can you can pull up uh, that scene from A New Hope and this footage, put them side by side, and it's set up identically. Yeah. No. Um. And, and the partner for this episode, um, Tor, uh, Toro Calican, I believe that's what uh, IMDb has it over here, and uh, he was a. He was a good, uh, you know, one episode kind of character. He, uh, and, and played it like a nice kind of counterpoint to the Mandalorian, as did the mechanic lady mm -hmm. uh, in the port bay. They were both uh, good, like, single episode characters. You, you kind of got a feel for them. Uh, with, uh, with Toro, you got this, uh, you know, bounty hunter that in training that uh, has a lot to prove and wants to make a name for himself, uh, but need but he can't necessarily do this one on his own, and so he forms a uh, kind of an unwary partnership with the Mandalorian. But uh, and, and in some ways, you know, you can tell that Toro is the less experienced of the two. But he's not uh, naive either. Like when he and the Mandalorian make their par partnership, and the Mandalorian demands the pact, he uh, the the puck uh, with the with the bounty on it. Uh, he breaks it and says, "I got the information as a just to make you know make sure that uh, the Mandalorian doesn't uh, run off without." Uh, uh, without him so uh, but then later on when they run into uh, the Tuscan Raiders 
you know, the Mandalorian, does, you know, kind of does like a little turnabout and uh, forces him to sell off his, uh, uh, trade off his, uh, you know, binocular scope thing. Mm -hmm. So there's good kind of uh, exchange and and play between the two characters. You feel like there's a a mutual respect between the two in the terms of uh, the fact that they're both bounty hunters. Like, I never got the sense that the Mandalorian ever really talked down to Toro. You know, obviously the Mandalorian is the, you know, better in terms of skill and every, and, and knowledge, but he is willing to work with Toro, give him the chance to prove himself and, and kind of take him under his wing a bit for this uh, tough uh, bounty. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> I agree. He uh, he didn't didn't talk down to him at all. No, but he he told him like you know you go after this particular bounty. She's an assassin. She's worked for the huts, and they're on the planet of the huts. So she's got a bit of a home field advantage here on this particular turf. So he's he's there going, dude. You go after this guy or girl, you're gonna die. Mm -hmm. Like. 24 hours, you're dead. Someone else will be after her. But you gotta think, too. Like, you know, they're playing this guy, like, uh, playing this Toro character as the youthful... The youthful... Um... Wannabe, I guess? Because he's not really a guild member yet. He, uh... He's trying to get in, and he's... Trying to go big to get in, you know, make his make his mark, become a legend, as it were. Mm -hmm. That's why he doesn't care about the money. He he doesn't want the money. He he wants the notoriety that such a big bounty would get him. Which I think is a interesting juxtaposition compared to all the other bounty hunters that we've seen that have, you know, really care only about the money. But it shows kind of like there's this. Even though he's not a full-fledged uh, bounty hunter guild member just yet, there's still a, a bit of honor between the two. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so... But unfortunately, that honor does only go so far. Like, I mean, where uh, you see... Toro, you know, getting told about what happened um, with the Mandalorian in the first few episodes, just getting the, the rundown from uh, the assassin lady there, and uh, deciding, hey, I can get my legendary status really quickly here, and probably get a good payday too. So, there is that. Yeah, ne <laughs> yeah never let um, the person you're hunting... And, and have them captured. Don't really, don't ever let them talk because they're just going to cause you problems. It reminds me of an episode of uh, Justice League. Yeah, I think it was the first Justice League cartoon, not Justice League Unlimited, where a team of villains have the Batman uh, captured. And even though they have Batman captured and they're looking to take down the rest of the Justice League, Batman's able to essentially get them to turn on each other and defeat them simply by getting in their heads and getting them to turn on each other and sowing discord and distrust between the two. Mm -hmm. And it kind of reminded me a bit of what um, the uh, her, her name's Fennec, the assassin lady. Right. Uh, what she was, was starting to do with him and uh, like, as soon as you know, she started talking, and you could see the wheels turning in his head. You know, you're, it makes you wonder, like, okay, which way is he going to turn on the Mandalorian, or is he going to uh, go through with, uh, you know, turning in this bounty? And in the end, like, I was a little bit surprised that uh, he ended up shooting her and going for the Mandalorian instead. So that was, I thought that was a, a nice little. You know, wrinkle to it that I wasn't necessarily expecting. Yeah, um, when it first came out, I was 
I was a little surprised by that too. Like I honestly expected it to go, okay, so we haven't had an overarching villain yet. So maybe this will be her, right? That's what I thought. And when he shot her and went at the Mandalorian himself, I was like, well, I guess I was wrong because I was expecting her to kill him and either go after the Mandalorian and get defeated some way that way or just bug her off and... Uh, like she said, she was trying to meet somebody in another another city. So she may have went and made a rendezvous at that point. But uh, yeah, like it's just one of those things. Like you didn't see it coming. That hey, newbie's gonna try to be Superman. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and. Like, it, it kind of reminds me a little bit of, like, the last season of The Flash where we had, um, uh, uh, what's her face? The mirror lady, um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. kill her, kill her husband, you know, after he proved to be quite an entertaining kind of, like, b oh, I know. through most of the season and really had the potential to be, like, the Lex Luthor for The Flash. And... In this case, like, like in some ways, it kind of felt that way where it's like, oh, the, here we have this interesting character. They have a really cool duel um, in the, you know, in the desert. And, you know, she's definitely competent. So you think, oh, you know, maybe there's going to be something here. And, oh, no, nope, she's uh, here and now she's dead. And I think it doesn't necessarily bother me this time. Like it, it might have been simply because of the length of the show yeah you know, the fact that it's only eight episodes and clearly so far everything's kind of been just episodic you have the running you know character of the mandalorian and baby yoda but you don't necessarily have like a whole lot of reoccurring characters i mean there are but you know it, it doesn't necessarily like right now we're kind of jumping from place to place in the season mm -hmm. and because of that there's no real you, you can have kind of characters that have like a a brief moment to to shine and then disappear because there's a galaxy of characters for the mandalorian and baby yoda to interact with whereas with a show like the flash it's you know you've got between 21 to 24 episodes per season and you kind of need a, a good cast of characters to keep that one location going so that you can kind of do something different each episode right because here yeah it doesn't matter we can probably be back to Tatooine um, season 2 and we may see uh, the mechanic again but we may not. We may see somebody else. He may be in a different bay completely. He may not even use Moss Eisley. He might go somewhere else. He, he, we might see Jabba the Hutt. You don't know. And and that's the beauty of it. The way, because of the short seasons, there's because they're so short, you can have throwaway characters that if they happen to come back later on down the road, so be it. And if they mm -hmm. don't, well, they had a great episode. Especially if you kill him, like you got to make that episode count. If you're scheduled to die that episode, and you've only just made it into the show, right? But I have a feeling that um, um, Holly is her name, the the mechanic lady. Mm -hmm. I, I I wouldn't be surprised if she shows up again in season two if she doesn't appear again later, just because I felt like you know she there was a quirkiness to her that I feel like you could kind of make her you know, character that kind of pops up here and there. And, uh, you know, we already see that she's pretty good with baby Yoda and, uh, you know, cares for him while, uh, the Mandalorian goes off on his hunt. And I also like the, her little three, uh, droid characters. I really like the design of them. Kind of remind me of like, um, I don't know if you've ever played Mega Man, but the little, uh, robot, uh, things with the helmets that kind of like, uh, pop up from the ground shoot at Mega Man and then kind of mm -hmm. go back down. 
Yeah, they're a fun design, but not the first time they've actually been used in Star Wars. Um, the first time mm. they show up is uh, in the prequels in uh, in Watto's shop in Ooh. Phantom Menace, in the very first one. That's the first time we see them in the the very first ah. prequel. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. been so long since I've seen Phantom Menace, but uh, you know, again, like I, even though I have issues with that movie and, and the uh, prequels, I was fine with the design. Like I thought there was like mm-hmm. a lot of inter- designs, a lot of interesting ships, and you know, the fact that they're you know used here, I, I think it's just because they were a, a great concept. Well, yeah, absolutely. You're gonna you're gonna use what works. It's mm-hmm. just the way that's just the way it is. You're gonna use what you know works. And yeah. those little droids working in, in shops and as mechanics helpers, that's what they were built for. They're repair type droids from the from the look of it. So of course we're gonna see them. Yeah, and lots of nice uh nonverbal comedy too with mm-hmm. them. Mm-hmm. And again, too, like, uh, not to go, I didn't mean to gloss over it, but uh, it's always good to, like, pop up in a new location, go to the tavern and see all the cool new kind of like, or uh, just strange creatures in the Star Wars universe that are just kind of residing there at the moment. Now, so like the visual design, well, not visual design, but the the ominous kind of look of the heads of stormtroopers on pikes. Yeah, yeah that was good. Just one go, thing I don't want to... Oh, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, it just goes to show that Tatooine is still an outer rim planet. I mean, a little bit law, more lawless than the rest, but... Mm-hmm. I mean... Hit my mic there. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, yeah, I mean, they're, they're still accepting Imperial credits, and the Imper- and the, Im- the Imperial, the Empire, is... Uh, now defunct so they're just using whatever currency they can out there right and uh i guess we should uh also talk about the two different battles that we saw um the the first one between uh mandalorian and toro versus uh the assassin uh that one was a lot of fun just this uh you know showdown between you know, two people and a sniper. And you know, even though, well, and the Mandalorian, you know, getting hit a couple of times, but uh, having the armor to withstand the the shots and Toro realizing, oh, I I don't have any armor. I, I'm, I'm, if I get hit like that, like I'm dead. Yep. And then the two of them using those, like, you know, flash weapons to blind the assassin while they, you know, worked on getting closer to her and, and making that charge. It was, it was definitely, a, and which, you know, lay, later played a point, a part of uh, the battle between Toro and the Mandalorian. Yeah. It was a good way to kind of come full circle in the whole episode. Also a good way to show how green Toro actually was. I mean, he just got done fighting with the Mandalorian and seeing these flashbang things in action, but didn't think, hey, he could use that against me. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, it causes his demise. Yes. And he got a little too confident in his abilities and kind of forgot about, you know, that he had a partner with that. So overall, I, I, uh, I really enjoyed this episode. Yeah, me too. I even thought the, uh, the dog fight in space there was, uh, which was the reason he ended up on Tatooine in the first place was a, a nice little thing. It was good to see some space battling again for the first time in a little while. 
I would agree with that. And between uh, ships that aren't uh, a TIE fighter or X-Wing or the Millennium Falcon. Yes, that was also also nice. No um, familiar, familiar ship designs. So yeah, it just goes to prove that Star Wars does have more than those things. I think that's uh, the best way for it to continue in the future is mm-hmm. just, uh, mm-hmm. you know, not to not to forget the past or anything, but to expand upon it. It's not like we won't see TIE fighters and X-Wings. Just a little foreshadowing there for everybody. Because they will make an appearance briefly in certain episodes. For sure. But, yeah. And there's only one other thing I had to mention. And it comes down to the very tag scene-like last couple of moments in this episode. I mean, you could have been watching a Marvel movie and waiting for the credits to roll and seeing that this is a tag scene during one of their Avengers movies or Iron Man. This is very tag scene-esque the person walking up to the corpse of the bounty uh, the bounty the assassin and uh, there's your twist who is this guy or girl stay tuned but the one thing I did like I thought was rather amusing and I don't know if you caught this it's really subtle And I've watched this episode now three times, so I just caught it this time around. Did you notice that as he was walking up, um, because of the, I just thought of this because of the nature of this being a space western, the sound that his boots were making on the, the, the sand sounded almost like spurs jangling as he was walking up. I thought that was great. I missed that, but, uh, that, that is a nice touch. But yeah, that was the last thing I wanted to mention because just because I thought that was a, a great little uh, nod to the the western right there. Was, mm-hmm. there. was there anything else that you had that you wanted to uh, bring up while we were on the subject? I think that covers it. All right. Well, with all that being said, then if you'd like to keep up with uh, with us throughout the week, I'm of course at. Dr. Allen 201 on pretty much almost so every social media platform out there. The show is at Syndicated Pipe Club. Also, this uh, this is a little new thing I was working on today, but you can find the show on YouTube a lot easier now. It is um, searchable as Syndicated Pipe Club. What I did was I went and uh, took my other pipe smoking channel and I've merged the two together. So now the show on YouTube uh, is branded as Syndicated Pipe Club. So there is a uh, direct link that you can use. I'll leave it for sure in the description down below because it's the first time you'll be hearing about it. Uh, Greg, where can everybody find you? Yes, you can find me on Twitter at the underscore Badger Piper and also Instagram at the Badger Piper. Those are the two places I like to hang out. Awesome. And you can always uh, check us out on our website, uh, fandompipes.wixsite.com slash syndicatedpipeclub. And of course, as I already mentioned, right here on YouTube. Be sure to subscribe to the channel and ring that bell so that uh, you'll be notified as soon as our latest video updates. Uh, Also, be sure to check out the podcast of our version, uh, podcast version of our show available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, uh, Google Podcasts, and uh, any real uh, podcasting aggregate that you use. If you want to send us an email, you can always get in touch with us at reverseflashtime at gmail.com. Well, Greg, that's another episode down. You got any final thoughts for the people? Uh, just uh, 